everybody, it's James Lindsay. You're listening to another exciting episode of New Discourses Bullets, where I give a bullet point type summary of one single topic from woke Marxism that you need to understand so we can beat it. We got to talk about reflexivity. So I don't want to talk about reflexivity like all out reflexivity, but the short version of reflexivity is when everybody has to talk about certain things and in a certain way, you're in a reflexive environment where um, if you're not talking about it, it becomes a subject of conversation that you're not talking about it. Why hasn't so-and-so commented on what so-and-so's take? Why are they so silent? A reflexive environment is one where everybody has to talk about a certain thing. That thing is going to be very polarizing, and there are either going to be one or two right ways to talk about it, usually that are going to be diametrically opposed to one another. And that means it's a dialectical weapon. When um, George Soros famously shorted the the pound sterling in like 92 or whatever, which led to him writing the alchemy of finance, where he said that alchemy is not interested in truth like the scientific method. It's interested in operational success. The method he said that they used to do the alchemy of finance was reflexivity. The idea is that uh, you start ginning up an idea and make the idea becomes true because everybody starts talking about it and believing it in a particular way. So the current thing takes place in a reflexive environment. What do I mean by that for the four normies still listening to my podcast that don't know what the current thing is? Whatever the big active measure, whether it's we've all got to talk about Ukraine war right now, oh, we've all got to talk about uh, COVID-19 right now, or vaccines, or masks, or two masks, whatever that breathless thing is, BLM, do you, do you think that Black Lives Matter? Whatever that thing that we all have to talk about breathlessly, currently, right now, and if we don't do it right away, we're missing an important window, that's a reflexive thing. And so the reflexive environment is the environment in which social and political, and I guess to a degree economic alchemy takes place. What Soros did was he bet hard against the pound sterling. And then he started a reflexive media environment that, oh, it doesn't look good for the pound. It doesn't look good for the pound. It doesn't look good for the pound. And everybody's the pound. Is the pound in trouble? Is the pound in trouble? What's going to happen with the pound? And by using his media connections, he was able to put a lot of stuff out that made it look like the pound might be in trouble, created a sense of inevitability. The sense of inevitability came true. And then you end up he ended up making billions of dollars because he had bet against the pound and then created a reflexive environment that the pound might be in bad shape and might be looking at a rough time. So another way to put it is that uh, a reflexive statement is a statement that becomes true or becomes false based on whether or not somebody believes it or doesn't believe it. The kind of archetypal uh, reflexive statement is um, this is a revolutionary moment. If everybody starts believing it's a revolutionary moment and now is the moment to to be revolutionary, guess what you're going to have? A revolution. So it came true. If nobody believes it, it's going to fizzle. Nothing's going to happen. So it becomes, it's not true or false in and of itself. It becomes true or false based on whether or not everybody starts believing it. And if uh, the, the big narratives that they push are designed to get everybody to get swept up in a reflexive movement that rapidly changes people's values and views, expectations, and so on. It's almost like social contagion or the madness of crowds or mass, uh, what do they call it? Mass something psychosis, um, mass effect psychosis, whatever it was that uh, Matthias Desmond said about. And, And so the idea is that you're going to make everybody start talking about things in one or two ways. If it's one, it's that you want everybody to go in a particular way. There's only one right answer. Black Lives Matter at the end. If it's two, what you want is to create a pol- a polarized environment that is split and toxic and fighting and causes people to veer toward the extremes and away from one another and away from the middle. And so that's how reflexive environments work. Many leftist active measures, which is the correct name for these things, narrative-driven active measures in particular, are designed to create a reflexive environment. In fact, the way that it works is that the reflexive environment builds up through narrative. There's, hey, something's wrong. Hey, something's wrong. Hey, something's wrong. Hey, And they build it up and they build it up and build it up article after article after article. 
Oh, Elon Musk took over Twitter. The internet is less safe. The internet, the safety on the internet is going down. Look at all this bad language. Look at all this hate speech, the safety on the internet. But look at all these risks of cyber attacks. Look at all the people he fired. Maybe there's going to be cyber attacks and you should have to build this up. And then there's a precipitating event where all of a sudden the reflexive environment, all that reflexive potential that was built up by the narrative is ignited all at once into a reflexive environment. And in the reflexive environment, we have to make a lot of very fast political decisions because if you don't get swept up in the movement of the reflexive environment, you're out of touch, you're on the wrong side of history, you're a bad person. BLM is exactly that. That's what happened in 2020. So let me lay that out. For years, at least starting kind of before, uh, but at least starting in 2013, when Trayvon Martin died at the hands of George Zimmer, uh, Zimmerman, the Black Lives Matter, that's when the Black Lives Matter movement started, by the way. That's when the word woke started to become a, a watchword outside of like kind of very narrow corridors. If you don't know, woke is an old word, but woke became kind of a thing uh, after the 2008 uh, production or release of Erica Badu's song, Master Teacher, which has in the refrain, stay woke, stay woke, stay woke, talking about racism in the police. So this long building narrative that the police are racist, George Zimmerman was acting like a vigilante cop, and then we had Michael Brown and Ferguson at the end of 2014, the police are racist. That was a huge thing for almost the whole year of 2015, if you've forgotten. Uh, BLM was all over the place. They were blocking traffic. They were doing all the stuff. It didn't quite catch on. Then you had just this series of say their names, and you you could rattle off the names. Breonna Taylor was a big one. Ahmed Arbery was a big one. But all these cases where there you know there's this persistent systemic racism against uh, black people, particularly in policing, particularly by cops. And then finally they got. I mean, there was like they tried to get one. They tried to get one. There was another one in the news every few weeks. Then all of a sudden they finally got the. The match hit the hit the ground in a sense when you had Derek Chauvin's knee on uh, a literally drug overdosing and dying George Floyd's shoulder blade as he freaked out and went through his death throes or things that led up to his death throes 20 minutes later or thereabouts. And so the reflexive environment took off. So for years they built up reflexive potential and then the shoe dropped and the reflexive environment took off and virtually every institution, every corporation, every uh, university, every school, every state and city, every everything put out statements in favor of Black Lives Matter, rapidly changed their policies, adapt, adopted huge amounts of DEI, implicit bias, unconscious bias, um, social responsibility, all these trainings, all these apparatuses, all these bureaucracies just got brought in by the truckload everywhere. Grifter, not just BLM grifting, making uh, 80-something million dollars in what is undoubtedly charitable fraud, but, um, you know, countless billions of dollars sold on the DEI implementation grift. Hundreds of administrators per university professionals and officers at virtually every major corporation and so on. the whole tone of everything in society changed for months actually for a couple of years it was a super contentious issue it took a couple of years for the psychological op operation parts of that active measure to wear off uh, and for people to start seeing clearly again because the reflexive environment around that one was so strong that's reflexivity that's what you have to understand because that's how they really move the ball. They gin up a narrative, gin up a narrative, gin up a narrative, wait for a precipitating event or moment. Critical race theory got off the right ground where they pushed and pushed and pushed. So there were race problems and the critical legal studies got invited to the conference and they got on stage and accused everybody of being racist. And you can almost imag imagine it like glass shattering. And all of a sudden things went crazy, reflexive environment took over and the critical legal studies movement died in critical race theory grew up out of its corpse. And that is how they do so much of what they do. So the dialectical game in general very frequently depends, when is it mass scale, the macro dialectic in society almost always depends on creating a reflexive environment 
and then maximizing the push that you get during the active phase of that dialectical environment. So what I want to talk about, now that you know what that looks like, it has a name, you can understand the name. Why is it called reflexive? Because first of all, everybody's acting reflexively like a reflex. And second of all, because everybody's reflecting off of one another, it's reflexive in that regard as well. Okay, so I want to tell you how to stop it. So I'm going to do that by means of metaphor. And this is actually one of the single most important tactics for fighting back every one of these mass struggle sessions, pile on effect that you get, trash talking. They're like uh, Moms for Liberty got put through like a dozen times. Who knows? I get put through them. These are all reflexive environments. Everybody is trying to create the sense that something really is moving. It's all trending in a certain direction. And there's either one or two right answers that are either the direction every. Everybody has to go together or the two that are supposed to fight with one another to generate the energy. Okay, so the way that the dialectical game works is to build a narrative or to set a polarizing fight around a set of narratives. No, Christian nationalism is the way forward for America and we have to renew the moral values of the country. Or Christian nationalism is the greatest threat. It's a preparation for a second January 6th, blah, 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 which sounds very much like a federal operation. The that's a two-pronged reflexive environment, by the way. The goal was to polarize around that issue, which is exactly what you do if you were setting a trap, by the way. The goal of the dialectical game in general, because it, when it's a dialectical reflexive environment, is that it depends on two poles fighting to gain its energy, is to get people to fight about the details. Well, Black Lives Matter, yes, of course it matters, but that movement's very different. And now you're in the weeds and you're fighting about that. Well... You're fighting about, you know, the biology of trans, like that nobody gives a, nobody that's pushing trans gives a flying crap about biology or they wouldn't be pushing trans. They're already suppressing biology, ignoring biology, denouncing biology. You bringing biology to bear just makes you look out of touch. You're arguing within the details and the facts. Then the goal is to get people, oh, well, the Christian nationalist said, oh, oh, Rob Reiner put out a trailer. And he's just wrong about what Christians believe and about what Christian nationals are. Of course he's wrong because you took the bait and you're arguing about it because the dialectical game is to get people to fight about the details and the facts. Granted, that has to be done on some level because they need to be there. But to the activists pushing the issue, the dialecticians playing the game, the facts are completely irrelevant. They're utterly throwaway to the operation. They have an operation going on. The goal is to get everybody to think one or one of two things to move the football, political football, in some direction. And that requires generating a lot of energy. And that requires getting a lot of people, including a lot of the normal people on board. Oh my God, Christian nationalism, that's white nationalism. It's on the rise. You can see how that prong of the dialectical weapon will be wielded when it's time to go. So what actually has to be done is not to argue about the details, not to argue about the facts, not to, oh, well, if you actually watch the video, then you'll see they want you to do that. Well, what they don't understand is they want you to say they don't understand. They know they don't understand. The foot soldier morons that are following along on the ground that are the, like, you know, living slogans, they don't. The people who are pushing these, they know they're getting it wrong, and they know that things that go that are a little bit wrong go more viral. The goal is to create a viral emotional state. That's the objective. That's the whole plan. I'll give you an example of why things that are a little bit wrong go viral. At one point, I made this poster, this meme, and it said, be the quit in equity. And I said something like, do your part for diversity. I misspelled diversity. Actually, I did it on accident, but then I noticed it and I didn't fix it before I put it because I knew that if I misspelled something, it would go viral. And so like every leftist in the world tried to do a pile on on me because I misspelled diversity. And so they tried to like point out that I misspelled diversity, but the be the quit in equity, you know, do your part for diversity or whatever, went mega viral because like every major leftist account got a hold of it and made fun of it because they couldn't leave alone the fact that I had put a misspelling on it. So they know the details are wrong. They want you to argue, oh, what they don't understand is community notes seems to put some, some cold water on this. But other than that, they want people arguing. They want people fighting. There are chaos agents whose job it is to show up in the mentions and to keep the fight going or start or spark the fight or get the, get the whole thing, um, confused and, and polarized. 
That's how the dialectical game works, because the goal is to create a reflexive environment around a crisis, that's your current thing, that demands a fast-acting solution to a huge problem that people only just now became aware of, but were led over the pre preceding months or maybe even years to be vaguely suspicious might be a problem. See, they vaguely suspected there's a problem with police racism. They vaguely suspected that there might be an issue with Christian nationalism. They vaguely suspected that there might be, uh, you know, whatever it happens to be. It doesn't even matter. Russian, Russian, but Vladimir Putin is a super good guy or super bad guy. They vaguely suspected it might be the case. And then all of a sudden, there's an event. The Ukraine war breaks out, and now we have to take a position on Vladimir Putin and fight with each other and create all this weird energy about it and lots of opportunities for people to say, oh, well, you're just a Ukraine shill. You're just a Putin shill. You're just, you bought, and everything gets lost, and they're able to do their politics because everybody sounds crazy and everybody's mad, and something has to be done right now, and the people who are controlling these things know exactly what needs to be done, and, and they're going to take advantage of it. So what actually has to be done with these, rather than fighting about the details, trying to correct people, trying to get into the weeds, don't get into the weeds of a reflexive attack. What you have to do instead is identify that it's a reflexive active measure that has targets. You have to be able to name the targets, what they are, who they are, how it works, what its goals are, and to make a convincing case that it is a targeted operation that's trying to pull people into behaving in a certain way so that it can achieve its goals. And what I want to give you is an analogy for what you do about that or how you do this. When they are building the reflexive potential. That is when they are laying the narrative arcs, when they are building the polarization and the tension, when that's happening, the analogy I want you to think of, I want you to picture the country and I want you to picture it like a big wooden board or something. Maybe it has some pine needles and sticks and leaves and stuff on it and somebody spraying lighter fluid. That's building reflexive potential. And what they're waiting for is a moment where something will hit a flash, where it'll penetrate even in normie land, like George Floyd dying with Derek Chauvin's knee on his shoulder blade, obviously going through the throes of a, of a horrible death that turns out to have been uh, a drug overdose, but which could have been him not being able to breathe because of that knee on his shoulder blade. Um, when that match hits the lighter fluid, it all blows up. The whole country catches on fire. That's the image. They're spraying lighter fluid. They're spreading lighter fluid. They're spreading tinder. They're spreading flammables. They're spreading explosives, black powder, whatever you want it to be. And they're waiting for the match. And when the match comes, see, we told you, look, there's a huge racism problem under the surface. And blah, blah, blah. You get the idea. The whole point is to build, 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 build this thing that people are dimly aware of. They're spraying lighter fluid and then it explodes. When you argue the details and the facts and you get into the weeds, what you're actually in a reflexive, narrative, active measure, what you're actually doing is like you're trying to clean, you're, you see the lighter fluid and you're trying to clean it up with a squeegee. You can't absorb it. You're not wiping it up. You're not actually cleaning it up. You're just moving it around. You're spreading it further. You might get a little bit up, but for the most part, you're spreading it around. You're giving a more even coat. You're getting it everywhere that it wasn't. You're spreading it around like crazy in particular. So that's what you're doing when you're arguing about the details or the facts or the pieces of the reflexive uh, environment's narrative. And if you do that, you're doing their work for them. You're spreading more of the reflexive potential, more of the lighter fluid that's going to explode at the opportune moment, which could be a false flag. It could be an orchestrated event like Crystal Nacht was in Germany. It could instead be something completely unpredictable, like the George Floyd incident, that just you have to seize the moment where it is. You can tell that that had to be somewhat unpredictable because they were in this bind between COVID and, and racial justice all of a sudden. They had to pick which one was more important. And there was this huge conflict that lots of people saw through. So you can tell that they were hoping for a huge incident, obviously, because they were spraying the lighter fluid everywhere, but what they were not doing, what they, what they did not know was what it was going to be and when it was going to be. And they took advantage the second it hit, they went and they were ready to go. Um, so instead of trying to argue the details in a reflexive active measure, which spreads and therefore builds the overall reflexive potential, 
and gives it more energy and gives more people more reasons to get involved in the argument. It becomes more of a thing. More people get to deploy more articles. It becomes more interesting. The fact that it's happening gets it trending. Then people are talking about it. Why is everybody talking about this? The story about the story becomes the story. And the story itself is getting embedded in that vague consciousness. What you do instead is you call it out as an operation because once people realize that they're being manipulated with this and the goal is to create a reflexive environment where everybody's supposed to panic, freak out, and all go in the same direction all at once, that's like spreading flame retardant all over. What you're sowing is distrust, and the distrust is like baking soda or something that was just, just to stick in the analogy, that is a huge flame retardant. So when the match drops, maybe you get little sparks here and there, little flare-ups here and there, but you don't get the explosion. That's what you're trying to avoid. You're trying to explode avoid the explosion of the reflexive potential they built up. So your goal when fighting against dialectical political warfare like this, in reflexive environments, is to rob that environment of its reflexive potential before it becomes a reflexive environment. Um, Stephen Coughlin, who's a wonderful thinker in these matters, has this diagram of a plane flying by dropping dialectical bombs. And he says, what happens is you wait till the bomb goes off. That's the reflexive moment coming and everything going crazy and you run around in the blast zone freaking out about the blast and everything is getting damaged and everything is happening and you're not even paying attention to the plane that fl is not only flying by but in the second that you're occupied with the blast zone it's already launching the next bomb which is going to land a little further down the road a little bit later your goal has to be able to see the plane to see the trajectory of the bombs that's already dropped and ideally to be able to shoot down the plane so it can't keep dropping bombs. What that means is you're calling out the operation to steal its reflexive potential away so that it cannot become a reflexive environment that they can use to drive their agendas in a moment of mass psychosis. That's the job. That's the goal. That's reflexivity and how reflexivity works. If you don't understand this concept, it's very difficult to understand any of their crisis-driven um, political maneuvering, and it's impossible to stop it. So we have to get more disciplined to be able to see that there's an operation, and then we have to be able to do exactly what you have to do anytime you see somebody doing something manipulative. You have to name the whole dynamic. This is the dynamic. It's an operation. Here's the purpose of the operation as an active measure. Here are its targets. Maybe it's Elon Musk. Maybe it's conservative Christians. Whatever it happens to be. Maybe it's the police. Here's what's going to happen. Here's how they're going to maneuver it. Here's the freedoms, the liberties, the things that we depend on in a society that they're going to try to take away as a result. And here's the panic it's going to induce. And they need you to argue about this and to panic about it. And if you can spread enough of that flame retardant, you can steal the reflexive potential and stop the reflexive environment and break their operation. That's what this is about.